Hey, what's up everyone? My name is Tim. It is so good to be together on Baptism Weekend. Baptism is a visible public profession of a person's faith in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Baptism, it, it doesn't make you a follower of Jesus, but it publicly identifies you as one. It is an outward expression of an interchange. If you'd like to get baptized today, we have pastors available to talk with you. Just find anyone with a name tag, or just let us know in the chat room if you're watching online, and we can help you take your next step. You know, at Foundations, we truly value relationships and doing life together. God didn't intend for us to live in isolation. He designed us to crave and thrive in relationships with others. With COVID, it's been a while since we've had any large community events where we can enjoy a great time with family, neighbors, and friends. We invite you to join us Sunday at 615 at City Park Pool in Fort Collins as we rented out the whole pool for foundations. It's free and a great opportunity for you to invite someone to come with you. We are one church in many locations from our Windsor campus, our Loveland campus, and if you're watching online right now, you are just as much as part of who we are. Now, if you're able, let's stand as we're going to sing together. Here we go. Church family, good to see you today. We've got a lot to celebrate. We're going to praise our God, exalt His name on high. Come on, let's pour it out from our hearts. He's worth
throughout my history If faithfulness is walk beside me That's right The winter storm is made a way for spring In every season from where I'm standing I see the evidence of the day Praise Him. Yeah. Amen. Hey, you know, we have a lot more praising to do, but we're going to save some of that praising for the end of our service time together when we're going to see brothers and sisters demonstrate the evidence of God in their lives as they step into the waters of baptisms. Are you excited for that? Man, I can't wait. I'm getting teary-eyed up here just singing that song like, ugh. So I'm so excited. But before we get to that, let's turn to each other. You can wish each other a good morning. Hey, online, good to see you.
Well, hey, good morning, Foundations. It is wonderful to see each and every one of you. So glad that you decided to make it. And thanks for those of you who are joining us at Windsor, too. Can we give it up for Windsor, you guys? We love Windsor. Great to see you guys over that screen. And uh, thanks for those of you who are joining us online as well. Guys, I have to tell you that uh, this moment to me, whenever I'm kind of sitting over there and I'm kind of like a horse in the gate, I can't wait to, to get up and to do some teaching because I feel this burden of what God wants to do in my heart, uh, through our hearts as a church, uh, through our families, uh, wherever we live, that he's getting ready to do something incredibly powerful. And so this is one of those moments of disproportionate influence. Whenever we gather the church together, whether it's over the screen, whether it's in a room like this or in Windsor, stuff is getting ready to go supernatural, if you know what I'm saying, okay? And I'm not trying to hype it up. I'm just saying I believe with all my heart that you didn't come in here, you didn't sign up here or log in here to, to be entertained or to be informed. But there, there's a hunger within us to be transformed. And we're going to go deep together. These moments are crackling with redemptive potential. And I hope you believe that. And I hope you came expectant. That's what we've been praying for as a team, that God would move in and through us while we're together in these moments. And that's what we're trusting him for, okay? Some of you, you're going to be able to experience that together as you get baptized to the cheers of your brothers and sisters around you later on in the service. And we can't wait to be able to do that together too. Well, let's jump into what we're going to talk about today. Uh, so uh, years ago, uh, when my, my kids were smaller, uh, there was this really cool opportunity that we had uh, to take them to a, a camp. And it was a father-son camp or a father-daughter camp. And at different times, I got the opportunity to take each of my four children twice. And I wanted to be really intentional about these times when we went to this camp. And here's a picture of this camp. It's just a really beautiful place in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. And it was a nine-hour drive, just me and a kiddo. And I would let them drive in a parking lot in a state park with nobody else around, okay? Uh, uh, we, would, we would have fantastic conversations. We'd do like birds and the bees talks. We'd talk about anything. They were captive audience. They were horrif horrified. Nine hours of, anyway, it wasn't that long. But we had so much fun connecting with each other. And then at this camp, we're there for five days together. And I wanted to be really intentional about this. Uh, it, you could pray for pastor's kids, any pastor's kids that you know, because it's just a weird life, okay? You don't like really have weekends with, with your parents, and it's just kind of an odd thing. So I really wanted to invest in these five days. So I decided to do something pretty early on with each of my kiddos when I would go for these, this week-long experience, and I would do a treasure hunt. A treasure hunt, kind of a hot and cold treasure hunt. Like at the end of the time together, at the end of the five days, there'd be like this three-hour thing that we'd go on, and I'd be planning it all week long. I'd come up with, with, us, with clues of places where we had been. Maybe we had, we had gone canoeing on the river, or maybe we had gone hiking or climbing a tree or going up some climbing tower and watching the stars at night or, or, or tracking a wolf or something. I mean, we'd, we'd do these cool things, and i try to remember where there were significant conversations, conversations that seemed to have a little bit more weightiness to them, and i try to capitalize on them by circling back around. So I'd, I'd, I'd have seven or eight or sometimes 10 or 12 like, little clues on little pieces of paper, and, and I'd write a clue down, I'd fold it up, and I'd stick it in like a, a tree stump or something, or, 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 or a, a, a crack in the wood in the rafter of the cabin, or, or, or one time with George, I remember putting it in a Ziploc bag in underneath a rock in a stream where we'd found a bunch of clay, and we're having fun playing around with that. And, 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 and the idea behind these clues is that they weren't riddles that were trying to stump the kid. They were trying to get them to go to the next place, and then, and then the next place, to find the next clue, and then the next place, until eventually there's this really great reward at the end. Sometimes it was a knife like, or a compass for the boys or like a necklace or a stuffed animal for, for the girls, but it was something that, that, that they would be really excited to be able to get. And while we would do these little treasure hunts, and I'm walking right there with them, and, and I'd have to kind of, some, kind of sometimes nudge them in the right direction. Like, you're getting warmer. You get, well, you're getting colder. You're getting, co getting warmer. And, and it, was, it was a great way for me to be able to teach them some real quick age-appropriate life lessons, what's it like to kind of search for what God has for us in life? And I'd help to uh, make sure that they understood that, you know what, Scripture is a lot like these clues in life, kind of like this, this map of how to go down this path with God where he helps us to understand where he wants us to go next. And there's always reward at the end of the journey with him, but the real reward is the journey with him. And I try to encourage them to understand that, you know, hey, even on this side of heaven, 
God willing, I'll be with you for a long time. Your earthly dad, as long as I'm alive, I'll, I'll always be here with you. If you need help, if you want me to walk through something with you, I, I'm going to be here. And, and so I just try to chock it full of all kinds of life lessons for them in these like hot, cold treasure hunts, we call them. And they were really fun things to be able to do. Question for you. Um, when it comes to understanding God's will in your life, how do you figure it out? How do you figure it out? That's what we want to talk about today. How do you get wise to God's will? How do you get wise to God's will? I'm gonna, we're going to process this a little bit. And this is important to figure out because a lot of times when I talk with people about how do they try to discern God's leading in their life or his, his guidance in a particular uh, difficult crossroad or, or challenge or some kind of a situation where, where they've got a couple of options and they both seem to be pretty good and which one do I, do I go for? Do I get married or, or, or do I not get married? Is it, is it Carl's Jr.? Is it Taco's Bell? Whatever. There's like major life tensions and what do you do in those kinds of moments? Sometimes... People have this perspective that understanding God's will is kind of like a game of hide and seek with him. You know, and, and, and I would argue, no, I think it might be more like a game of hot and cold. So, so you know the difference? So hide and seek, the person who's trying to hide is doing their level best never to be found, right? Remember doing that when you were younger? Hide and seek. Like I'm, you're trying the hardest that you possibly can to stay hidden because you don't want to be found because that's how you win. Whereas hot and cold, anybody ever played hot and cold before? Hot and cold is when you're, you're in a situation and, and someone's trying to help you find something. So I need a volunteer, and, and when I was younger, I would, I would be mortified if the pastor said, hey, can you help me? So I'm going to look for a hand this time. Anybody want to help me out with something? You're not going to have to talk. Okay, yeah, sure. Wow, okay, brave. Are you volunteering your son? I was volunteering. <laughs> well, come on over here. Now, I'm not going to make you talk or anything out saying, outside of saying, what's your name, man? Tony. Hey, Tony, I'm Marcus. Nice Marcus. to meet you. How long have you been a part of Foundations? All right, great, fantastic. Glad you're here, Tony. All right, guys, what we're going to do right now, and Tony, I want you to listen real carefully, is we're going to play a little game of hot and cold. On this platform somewhere is this unbelievable reward for you, okay? okay. Now, I know you wish you'd all had got, you know, so, <laughs> so, so we got to do this, and you got to keep moving, okay? That's kind of the thing. So go ahead, start looking for some reward, and I'm going to tell you if you're getting hotter or colder. Okay, get a little warmer, 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 yeah. Oh, you want to get, no, that's not the, yeah. <laughs> nice try, nice try. All right, you actually are quite warm, though. Yeah. No, colder. Colder. Colder, getting colder. Getting warmer, getting warmer, 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 yeah, warmer. Go to the right. Warmer. There you go. You see anything to your left? Warmer, hot, burning hot. Is that anything? <gasps> Look at that. Oh, man. Come on back in the light over here. So we got a little foundations hat, okay, for Tony. Well done, Tony. Good job. I found that in Carl's office. He's on sabbatical. And apparently the lice thing is not an issue anymore. So, guys, so hot and cold is, is this game where someone's trying to help you. So let's kind of debrief real quickly what just happened there with Tony and I. First of all, you could see the unbelievable chemistry that existed between us, right? He, he's looking to me for, for some kind of direction and step by step, like he, he's not taking giant leaps or just running somewhere. He's even kind of doing this and kind of looking over and he's listening for my voice to see am I, am I kind of in the right spot or not. He, he's not just kind of wandering wherever he wants to go, ignoring uh, the, the verbal direction that I'm giving him. And the whole point was, even when he's getting closer and closer to it, it's like over there. I mean, this is how I believe and this is how I've experienced God's will in my life where I'm trying to, trying so hard, trying so hard to lean in to understand, God, where are you leading us? And the harder I try, the more all in I seek, the more he reveals. Now, it's not as fast as that, is it? Ever. No. Sometimes it can take years if you're in a really difficult situation. And sometimes God is kind of leading us along a little bit more slowly, right? It's never in leaps. It's usually in small steps. But God is always there trying to help us find what we need to find. He's always going, Psst, getting colder, you're getting warmer, you're getting hot, you're getting, oh, you're getting burning hot, right? This is what God does. Now, why? Why is this important for us to be able to understand? Because if it was up to me, can I be honest with you? If it was up to me, wouldn't it be just great to get a heavenly email? <laughs> Seriously, some of these life decisions that we have, it's like, God, I want to do what you want me to do. 
So can we just kind of cut through it, please? And would you just send me a text or an email? or something? I would love an email where the subject line just says, clear next step for you. And then inside the email, it says something like, yes, you should marry that person. He or she is the one, right? Or, or no, you should not take that job because I've got an even better one for you that I'll show you next Tuesday. Something just really specific like that. Yes, you should move to that state or you should go to that school or you should date that person or you should choose that fork in the road. Guys, when it comes to figuring out his will, wouldn't an email from God be a whole lot easier? Yeah, it would. That's okay to say. It'd be a whole lot easier, but it wouldn't be better. It wouldn't be better because it would also make us a whole lot lazier. And since God is a loving Heavenly Father, He is all about helping us to become wiser as we do life more and more with Him. That's the win. It's the win of the treasure hunt. It's the win of walking down the path with him, hand in hand, in his, looking up at, at his eyes to see if is he, is he leading me somewhere, listening for his voice saying, am I getting, is this, should I look for it over there? It's doing life with him together. So he's going to choose the hot and cold treasure hunt over the email every time from my experience because he cares more about preparing you for the path than the path for you. So says who you might say. So, so far, this is all like, out of Marcus's head, okay? Uh, says who? So let's dive into scripture together and pressure test some of these ideas and give you some more. We're finishing up our series called Foolproof today, uh, where we're trying to get schooled in wisdom uh, from the book of Proverbs in the Old Testament. We've been learning that life hands us choices, like minute by minute, every day, life hands us choices. And the only way, the only way to enjoy a foolproof, more abundant life is to be wise, because when we're wiser, we're stronger. When we're wiser, we're, we're, we're deeper. When we're wiser, we make better decisions and we live with fewer regrets. We've also learned that wisdom works everywhere, in every single area of your life, every area, from your finances to your friendships, from, from work to your words, from your sexuality to your temperament, from your marriage to your parenting. And today, we're going to see that wisdom even works with your decision-making. It even works with getting wise to God's will. So again, key question, how do we get wise to God's will? Well, the hard candy of truth that we're gonna look at today comes from Proverbs chapter 25. If you brought a Bible or you got one with you, if you have a device, you can look that up, encourage you to do that. It's always fine to look at it on the screen, but I'm a big believer and there's something pretty cool about having it in your hands and interacting with it together, so I encourage you to be able to do that and especially to take notes because godly people take notes, okay? So uh, we're looking at this hard candy of truth from Proverbs 25. I'm calling it hard candy because Proverbs is wisdom literature, okay? There's multiple different kinds of genres in Scripture. One genre is wisdom literature. And wisdom literature is something you got to take your time with, something you got to go deeper with. So it's the hard candy of Scripture because you kind of kind of have to take your time with it. You got to suck on it a little bit. So we're going to suck on Proverbs 25, 2, okay? This is where King Solomon tells us, and you can see it here, it is the glory of God to conceal a matter. What? And it's the glory of kings or leaders or people like us to seek it out. It's the glory of God to conceal a matter. It's the glory of kings to seek it out. Today, my aim is to share four practices for the path that'll help you to get hotter and hotter and hotter in finding God's will. Four ways to discern his leading, to make wiser decisions and key milestones in your life. And guys, I gotta tell you, I have tested out these things for 25 years that I'm gonna share with you. And I, I literally would bet my life on them because they have worked every time, like without fail. Now, you might have heard messages before talking about God's will. How do you understand God's will? And there's like the, the one-on-one key five things. Or, well, if, it's, if there's something in Scripture that's against what you're wanting to do, then no, that's not God's will. If you're praying about it and you don't have a settled sense of conviction that that's okay, then no, that's not God's will. If the Holy Spirit who fills you and indwells you is not giving you a sense of, of peace or conviction or courage about something, then that's probably not God's will. If there are godly people in your life that love you and love God and they're saying, I don't know if this is the right thing for you, that's probably not God's will. If you're married 
and, and, and you're equally yoked and your spouse also loves God and you're processing through it with him or her and, and they're not united with you in that decision, that's probably not God's will. So those, those, that's just real quick. Th- those, things, those five things are really key areas to think about when you're processing God's will. I wanna go beyond that with you this morning and share four principles for the path, okay? But first, what does Proverbs 25.2 even mean? It's the glory of God to conceal a matter. It's the glory of kings, leaders, people, to to seek it out. What's that even mean? Well, Solomon is telling us that there's something beautifully, wonderfully, majestically, mysteriously glorious about God's revelation. How and when he reveals the treasure of his will to us. He he uses the word glory, and the word glory is the Hebrew word chabod. Can I hear you say chabod? Chabod. Now wipe the neck off of the person in front of you, okay? Chabod means glory, but it also literally means significant. It means means weighty. It means something is heavy. Chabod. These are significant, weighty, heavy things in life that God wants to reveal to you. And he doesn't conceal them like, I never want you to find this. It's like this treasure hunt because it says it's the glory of God to conceal a matter, but it's the glory of kings to seek it out. There's something beautifully, wonderfully, majestically, mysteriously glorious about our proactive search and discovery of God's treasure. And the word seek that's used here is a specific Hebrew word that is indicating an intense investigation, a deep exploration, an all-out search. In other words, it's proactively discovering God's will for our lives. And whenever we engage that kind of activity, that is an adventure. So if you're here today or listening in today and you're looking for real adventure, welcome to a life with God. Because following God should never be boring, partly because he's never going to drop a map in your lap. That's just not how he operates, okay? Instead, he invites us out into the holy wild of an all-in action-packed, adventurous exploration of real life with him, with him. That's why King Solomon is saying this in Proverbs 25. It's the glory of God to conceal a matter. It's the glory of kings to seek it out. He's giving us this principle. Go all in to get wise to God's will. Go all in to get wise to God's will. That's why we're saving this message for the last in our series in foolproof. Because this, like, this is like the punchline of the entire book of Proverbs. Proverbs 25.2, he says, go all in in your search to get wise to God's will. Now, I, I've shared this uh, uh, most often when I'm talking with candidates who are looking to be a part of a team and, and some kind of a, a, a church setting, and I've, I've never taught about it before. I've talked about it a lot, but never taught about it. And, and so I'm excited to finally kind of bring it to a message point and to be able to share it because I've learned over the years it is unbelievably helpful because in Proverbs 25.2, you have a king giving us wisdom on how to be able to understand God's will. And you might think to yourself, wouldn't it be amazing if we had an example of what it looks like for a king to be able to understand God's will, for someone to really go through it methodically and slowly to help us to understand what does it look like to discern God's will. So you got Proverbs 25.2, where King Solomon is saying this, but what I want to show you now is the illustration of this principle, the practice of this principle in Psalm 25, where King David, Solomon's daddy, is living this out. I wonder if this is where Solomon got this idea of this particular proverb. So I want to take a look at Psalm 25 just briefly, and you can read the whole thing later. We're just going to look at a couple excerpts out of this for the sake of time right now. Wish we had more time to go into it. But this is King David living out this proverb that Solomon would eventually write, probably because Solomon saw this modeled in his father's heart in the way we see it in Psalm 25. He shows us four ways how to go all in to get wise to God's will. And and again, as I was preparing this, I was thinking about the fact I've talked about this a lot with friends. I've never taught about it. So I've got like 25 plus years of testing out what I'm about to teach out. This is gonna be a really long message, okay? But not really, but it gives me great pleasure to see some of your concern on your faces. But so, but really, I wanna encourage you, check this out. Check out this page in my Bible. This is Psalm 25 in my Bible. I've had this Bible for just about 30 years. And, and you can see I'm running out of room on this Bible page. Why? Because around the, the margins of the Bible, it didn't start out this way. Like the first time it happened, I wrote like, like a key like issue that I was trying to wrestle through. Like, should I go to law school or should I go into ministry? 
And then over time, I like would add another thing, and I'd be going through what I'm learning in this psalm. And, and then over the last 25 years, you can see there's 18 different like major life milestones, key decisions that I needed to make where I desperately needed wisdom. And I didn't know which way to go, but I followed these principles that we find here. And, and what's fascinating about this is I'm running out of room on this. I got 18 different key life decisions. And what I learned is that about every year, year and a half, as I look at the, the dates on those things going around my life, I don't know if this is your experience, this is just mine, there's nothing magical or authoritative about this, but it seems like every year or year and a half in my life, God drops like this major challenge in my lap or our family's lap, challenging us to, to think about something, challenging us to, to make a choice that's going to change the direction of our lives about every year, year and a half. And I'm so grateful as I look at that, there's like a mercy in that. Like it's not every other week. Aren't you grateful? It's about every other year, year and a half where there's like some major thing. Maybe it's a conflict issue. Maybe it's a calling issue. Maybe it's should I get married or not? Maybe it's who should I marry? But there's like major, maybe there's a health thing going on. Maybe there's a, there's a job or career thing that's happening. But about every year, year and a half, as I've been following God, I get these like major decisions where I need wisdom outside of my own heart. And so I put these four practices to the test over and over and over, and they never fail. You want to hear them? Are you sure? All right, here we come. They all start with H, okay, because we want you to get hotter, right, when you're discovering God's will. That sounded better last night when I was thinking about it. But, so we're playing hot and cold, remember, when it comes to finding God's will. Here's the first H, ready? Humble yourself before him. Humble yourself before God. Guys, this is the non-negotiable starting line to getting wise to God's will. It's talking about relinquishing our need for control, about surrendering our fate, about not striving anymore. And I got to be honest, I know as soon as we hear that, there's some of us consciously or subconsciously saying, I'm out. I like those other five. This idea of humbling, not there. Why? Because this is hard. It's hard to humble ourselves. But this is like the first stepping stone on this path of discerning God's will, of getting wise to God's will. And this wisdom comes straight out of the mouth of King David. Look at this in Psalm 25, a few verses. God guides, what's it say there? The humble. God guides the humble in what is right and teaches them, who's them? The humble his way. I mean, that's, that's pretty straightforward. God guides the humble, teaches the humble his way. Who then is the man who fears the Lord? He will instruct him in the way chosen for him. The Lord confides. I love that because it almost sounds like whispering. He's going to whisper in your ear. He's going to tell you a secret about your life. He's going to confide in you. Hey, I'm going to entrust something to you. He's going to confide in those humble ones who fear him. Now, uh, what David is doing here is he's giving us some deeper insight into the word fear, of fear of the Lord. And I wish it was a different word the way it's translated in English because it's, it is confusing. And J. Michael helped us uh, a few weeks ago understand a little bit better the fear of the Lord and that there's a biblical fear and then there's a worldly fear. There, there's a healthy fear, which is biblical fear, and then there's an unhealthy fear, which is worldly fear. There, there's the, ah, fear. Sorry, I don't scream well. And then there's the, ah, oh, fear. The, the reverential awe oh, and wonder. That's what it means to fear the Lord. You really can't even understand scripture apart from understanding the fear of the Lord. And David is helping us to understand here with this idea of the fear of the Lord is one way to express that is through humility. And I want you to notice how intensely relational this is. Humility cannot happen in isolation. There is no such thing of someone being humble as an individual apart from someone else. And here's what I mean by that. I hadn't thought about this before. This, this weekend I was thinking about that. To be humble, you literally have to put our, yourself in a lower position, which requires that someone else is being put in a higher position in your mind, in your heart, in your life. Does that make sense? To put yourself in a lower position means that someone else is being put in a higher position. That's you humbling yourself. Humility, to apply it spiritually, is me recognizing and responding to the fact that God is God and I am just little old me. I'm a creature. I'm not the creator. Now, it's not beating myself up over that. It's just a right recognition of who I am and who he is. Lately, I've been trying something each morning. And <laughs> it's been kind of helpful uh, I, I tell God uh, each morning that I officially resign my position as supreme sovereign over the universe. <laughs> and, and just even hearing it, I just imagine God laughing 
And, and, and I, think, I think it amuses him, and I know it helps me because it reminds me who he is and who I am. Look at how James talks about this. James 4, humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Man, this is just, that's why James is actually talked about as quite similar to Proverbs. This is like a proverb, really. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. See the command and see the promise and how they're linked, inextricably linked. In other words, James is saying down is the new up. Down meaning when we surrender, when we relinquish control, when we stop striving for something, it says when we do that, God will lift us up. He will not maybe, not sometimes, he will. Hey, quick quick straw poll, um, and if you're chat room, you can do this. Windsor, I want to see you. Raise your hands on this too, okay, because Dan is watching, all right? Uh, when it's your birthday, okay, uh, and, and you have the, the option, people are coming in like, hey, would you like a present or would you like a gift card? Like if I just got whatever I wanted for you, would you like a present or would you like a gift card? How many would say, I want the present? I'd love to see what they think about it and get me. Yeah, okay, interesting, all right. How many would say, I want the gift card? Okay, all right, so about two-thirds control freaks in this room. I don't know how many over there, but I would be in the same place, right? Because the gift card lets me get what I want to get, right? Give me the money, right? I want to get the gift card. I want to get something that that I want to get and when I want to get it. Friends, here's the thing when this comes to spiritual life, and I've learned this the hard way. A white knuckle grip on the reins of my life is an amazing symptomatic indication that I am being prideful. And then I'm heading for a crash. I have found that the only way to find control is to let go of it. And I hate that. But it is so hard to do. But it means humbly trusting him to guide and to teach. Something that he promises to do, right? See, the command comes fully equipped with the promise. But that demands humility. So you want to get wise to God's will for your life first. Humble yourself before him. Humble yourself before him. One last thought about this one. You can learn this the easy way or you can learn it the hard way. You either humble yourself before the Lord because you, you trust him. You trust him and you take him at his word and you obey his command. And that would be ideal and rare. Or you try to control your own life and you go your own way and you fall on your face enough in failure and you get bruised and bloodied enough that you cry out enough. And then you eventually say, okay, okay, I'm rock bottom, and I'm surrendering control to you. That's the hard way, and i got to tell you about this. That is my story. Whether it was with who to marry or what kind of a, a career to go into, like, God, I got this. I mean, guys, I literally said in my early 20s, I literally remember saying in a prayer, God, I've got it figured out. Thank you. I'm good. Any idea what was about to happen in my life? (laughs) Deep, painful crash and burn, right? God graciously shattered my lesser dreams, and he redirected me, but he had to do it because I'm an idiot through pain. Please learn from my tuition. Take the easy way. The easy way, you're going to hear God saying, you're warmer. You're getting getting warmer. Oh, you're getting hot. You're going to find it. You're getting hotter. The hard way, it's colder, colder, no, Turn, turn around. Go the, you're getting colder. Please turn around. Guys, whenever I have wanted to go my own way on this and said, you know what, God, I got to figure it out. The prideful way instead of the humble way, it's always resulted in pain. You don't want that. And that was David's experience too. He knew full well the pain of chasing after his own idea of what was best. He, you know, his way led down the cold path of adultery and deceit and betrayal and murder and shame and regret and guilt. And that's why I think he emphatically shouts this prayer to give us our next practice. This is Psalm 25, 4 and 5. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and lead me. For you are God, my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. Any question? (laughs) <laughs> Any question where David is now putting his focus as a result of falling down so many times? Any question what he's really hungry for? And this is number two. This is the second principle for the path. It is hunger for his best. Hunger for his best, his plan, his guidance. Don't just have like a, uh, I'm kind of curious what God's idea would be and which way I should go with this. This is a hunger 
This is like more than anything else. You've got a craving, a desire, an appetite to get after what he wants for you, his plan, and his guidance. And I gotta be honest again and tell you, uh, for most of my life, I have hungered for the Cheetos and Mountain Dew of life, okay? The junk food of life. Most of the decisions that I made, especially in my later teen years and early 20s, were, were like, that looks good, I'm gonna go that way. That's gonna taste good, I'm gonna go that way. It was Cheetos and Mountain Dew. And I love Cheetos and Mountain Dew. But the thing is, they're, they're satisfying for, for a couple minutes, right? But then what happens? Like in 10 minutes, you're like, I want some more Cheetos and Mountain Dew. And you just kind of get more and more addicted to that, that junk food lifestyle. What you find out is you're getting, you get a little dumpy over a while, after a while. And you're, you're not thinking as clearly anymore. And you're, you're, you're more sedentary. And you're not moving around as much. And, and you're like, is this, is, this, is this what life is? being nourished by junk food? I can't be nourished by, by junk food. See, I, I've found that in my life, a hunger for the Holy Spirit's best for you will always fill you. And like in a satisfying kind of way. He knows exactly what you need and he longs to give it to you and to give it to you in abundance. I've learned that his best is best. And this is important, whether we realize it in the moment or not. Here's a, a note that we found yesterday afternoon. We're going through our files as we're still unpacking boxes and stuff. And this is a note from George, our oldest son. Uh, the, the, the scene is uh, where this note originated was that Annie was, was rocking Lucy and putting her to sleep this some years ago. And, and, um, and George comes in and kept, kept interrupting. He wanted to stay up late and watch TV. And Annie said, no, you need to go to sleep. It's too late. You need to go to sleep. And so he writes this note and he slips it under the door. And it says, I love mom and dad, please, you know, he was 18 when he wrote it, so give him some grace, okay? <laughs> I love mom and dad is the best. And he crosses out, I love mom. Isn't that hilarious? It wasn't in the moment, okay? In the moment, it was hurtful. But now seeing it like, you know, like 14 years later, it's like, oh my gosh, this is so funny. And Annie had the wherewithal back in 08 to save it <laughs> so that we could laugh about it someday together. Now, George idolizes his mom, okay? But I can almost guarantee you in that moment when that happened, because notice the dad is best. Can I just call some special attention to that, please, for a moment? <laughs> probably what happened is George heard, no, you can't watch TV, you got to go to bed. And George probably came to me and said, Daddy, can I please watch a little bit TV? And I probably said, sure, buddy, of course. It's only 1130. And so <laughs> I'm sure that's kind of where this comes from. Now, we laugh about that, but can I tell you that I can still act that way? Oh my gosh, as we're laughing about it, I almost feel the Holy Spirit cramming my laughter back down my throat because I can still act that way to God when I am hungrier to get my way and I've got zero appetite for his way because sometimes I couldn't care less what his way is because there are the Cheetos and the Mountain Dew. It's not until we start to hunger for what his best is in our lives that we're gonna get wiser to what his will is for our lives. And I can tell you, the more I've ended up with the spiritual belly aches from binging and purging on junk food of my own choices in major moments, major moments, the more I've lost my appetite for calling the shots on my own and the hungrier I am for his best, his plan, his guidance. Because if I've learned anything these last 25 years of following Jesus, it's this, his best is best, always, without exception. And you don't always know that in the moment, but in hindsight, you always look back and say, oh, okay, I see what you're doing. Wish I could see it in the moment if you would have sent an email. But, okay, it's about the treasure hunt. It's about walking with you, doing life with you. So I want to get hungry and hungry for you. Here's another way to think about it. Uh, when, whenever I simply hunger for my own sense of what's best, I basically turn God into a heavenly waiter. Okay? Uh, where, where he exists to serve my needs, to wait on me, and to please me. Okay? I want you to imagine yourself in your favorite restaurant. Okay? And God walks up to you in his waiter uniform wearing all white, and he says, are you ready to order yet? And you say, yeah. Uh, for starters, I'll take a long life with perfect health and happiness. Hold the challenges, please. Okay, I'm, I'm crisis intolerant. Um, then give me a fantastic wife special, no issues. If I get her and she's got issues, I'm going to send her back, okay? And then I'll take a great job and a nice house on the side. And if you could throw some extra cash on that, that'd be great, okay? Oh, and I'm in kind of a rush so if you could speed it up, I'll remember that when tip time comes. 
maybe even a little beyond 10%. Okay, big guy, get off with you. Go on. Let's take care of it. Guys, when we do this to God, how rich and fulfilling is life? Do you think he allows us to just experience the Cheeto Mountain Dew route for a little bit? To get a little colder? Get a little further away? So we can finally realize that we need to relinquish control and to surrender to him. The sooner that we can realize that he's not the waiter, but he's actually the chef, the sooner we're going to hunger for his best because his best is best. So can I urge you just to memorize the prayer of these two verses? Can we put Psalm 25, 4 and 5 back up? Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and lead me for you are God my Savior and my hope is in you all day long because I'll tell you what, this is a power prayer. It's a power prayer that Annie and I have memorized and prayed frequently in getting wise to God's will at any crossroad in our lives, whether we should get married or not, whether it's going to seminary or not, whether it's adopting internationally, whether it's coming here to foundations. And God has always shown us. He's always taught us. He's always guided us. He's always led us without fail. And that's why right now, as we're sitting in Major Life Challenge 18, begging God for breakthrough wisdom, we're looking back over the last 17 times that he's brought about his best for us, and we're trusting that he's going to do it again. Because we remember in these previous 17 times, there were moments, especially in the darker challenges, where we're like, where are you? I mean, it's been a few weeks. And sometimes we realize, you know what? Sometimes it'll be a few months. Sometimes it'll be a few years. But he will always come through. He will always break through. And we can trust him for it because we've seen that, not only in Scripture, which is the authority for us, but we've seen it in 17 other situations in our lives together. And we remind one another of this through tears. This is so hard right now but we can trust him. He's going to give us the direction that we need, the wisdom that we need. He's going to break through. He's going to come because he always has. Now, but this doesn't mean that we just sit passively back in the waiting room. It means that we've learned to stay on the trail of the treasure hunt with him, hands like white knuckle grip, clenched into his, looking up at him to see what direction we're going to get, listening for his guidance all along the way because we've learned that wisdom is a proactive pursuit you never drift into wisdom. It's always this progressively proactive pursuit. All right, so that was number two. We're getting hot now. Uh, let's see the third way to get wise to God's will from Psalm 25. We're going to go quicker with these last two for those of you who are keeping time. Okay, Psalm 25. No one whose hope is in you will ever be put to shame. My eyes are ever on the Lord, for only he will release my feet from the snare. Doesn't say when, just says he will. May integrity and uprightness protect me because my hope is in you. You hear the book ending repetition there? Here it is, number three, hope in him. Hope in him. And it's important juxtaposition here. Hope in him, not a job. Hope in him, not that relationship. Hope in him, not your finances. Because if your life is like mine, I've found that there's like this life fallacy that I've clung to, and it's this. If I just get that X, then my life will rock. And the X might be some girl before I married, married Annie. The X might be some job. The X might be a, a house. I don't know. If, the X might be for you as a boat or the X might be a raise or the X might be your health again. I have to tell you, for the first half of my life, I had this out of whack and I just thought, if I just marry that person, life will rock. If I just go to law school, life is going to rock. It wasn't until God, as I say, graciously shattered those lesser dreams and redirected my life kind of stripped away the Marcus made scaffolding in my life that I was trying to hold stuff up together that I realized that the only thing really worth putting my full hope and trust in is him. Real satisfaction could not come from a woman. Men, shh, it couldn't. Real satisfaction will never come from a woman because the hole in our hearts as men is God-shaped. Women, the same is true for you. Real satisfaction can never come from a man. Please don't shout amen, Okay. Real satisfaction will only ever come from a relationship with God through his son, Jesus. That's where real fulfillment comes from. So we want to hope in him. Real fulfillment couldn't come from a career. Because we all know this careers are never going to be enough. There's always going to want to be more. We want to look for God's calling for our lives, for what will bring real purpose and impact with him and for him. Hope in him. 
You've heard it said maybe sometimes in other contexts, hope is not a strategy. Well, it is in this instance. It is when it comes to your relationship with God. Hope in him. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, probably one of the most famous passages in Scripture says this. Trust in the Lord, because the more you hope in him, the more you're going to trust in him. The more you hope in the Lord, the more you're going to trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. I love how extreme Solomon is in this. He doesn't say, you know what, in the stuff where it really matters, trust him. In the stuff where you just really feel stuck, that, that's where you want to lean in. He says, trust in the Lord with all your heart in all of your ways. Acknowledge him and he'll direct your paths. See, only he is enough. And when we fully hope in him and his plan for our lives, he moves, he does. He gives you the wisdom that you need because he longs to, because he loves to. So you want to get wise to God's will for your life? Hope in him. Because when you hope in him, you know you're getting hotter. And here's the last one. Number four, have confidence. Have confidence that he wants your best and that he will reveal it to you if you one through three. Okay? If you humble yourself before him, if you hunger for him, if you hope in him, have confidence that he wants your best and he will reveal it to you if you humble, hunger, and hope. Here's where this comes from. David declares this in Psalm 25. All the ways of the Lord are loving and faithful for those who keep the demands of his covenant. All of the ways of the Lord are loving and faithful. What, what beautiful descriptors and how amazingly comprehensive everything that God does in your life you can trust comes from a heart of love and that he's faithful. If he's promised you something, he's gonna fulfill it. Doesn't matter when, he's gonna and you can have confidence about that. Actually, David is really echoing God's words here in Jeremiah. Take, take a look at these. Call to me, God says, and I will answer you. And I'll tell you great and unsearchable things you do not know. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. And guys, whenever God promises anything to you, your confidence can go to like a whole new level. It can actually go to like conviction level because you can trust him with it, with your life, as a matter of fact. You can be a thousand percent confident that he wants your best and that he will reveal it to you and bring it to pass if you humble yourself before him, if you hunger for his best, and if you hope in him. That's when you can have white hot conviction that you're getting wise to God's will. So if we had to take this whole message and bring it down into one sentence, I think it'd be this. You will know his will when you go all in to seek it out. You will know his will when you go all in to seek it out. So go, go all in. Go all in. Just go all in to seek out God's will. Get wise to God's will. All right, last image for you to think about it is a highly spiritual one. It's this one. Anybody seen the movie The Matrix before? It's probably one of my favorite movies, an amazing critique about our culture. Uh, it's an older movie, but it still is relevant in so many ways. And if you remember, Neo is the protagonist in this movie, <clears throat> The Matrix. And, and there's this kind of gross scene I was going to show up, and I thought, nah, this is a little disturbing, where there's this big plug in the back of his head, like right about here, this big old plug, right? And there's this huge cable that you can plug into. It's got this long needle into his head. Some Sometimes he'll be sitting on this, this chair and they'll put this plug in the back of his head and they'll upload some crucial life skills like jujitsu or, or, or military combat skills or, or something that, that will help him to be more effective and fulfilling his, his mission. He plugs into the back of his head. I was watching that. One time I was like, hey, hey, that, that'd be really cool with wisdom. Why doesn't God just kind of plug something in and just... Pump in, upload all of the wisdom that I will need for every difficult decision in my life. Like every crossroads, when it comes up, like under six seconds, the upload, oh, okay, I'm going to take this route right here. Why doesn't he do that? Again, just to make sure we're listening. Because his aim is not to make life easier for us. His aim is to make life wiser with us. He wants us to go on this treasure hunt of life with him. So that every decision that we face, every major milestone, key moment, we're like, I just don't know what to do. That is an opportunity 
crackling with redemptive potential for you to lean into your relationship with him. That is what life is supposed to be like with God, this, this hot and cold treasure hunt with him walking down the path with him getting wiser together as we do life more and more with him. Did you notice with all four of these things, all four of these H's, that there's an intensely relational component to each one? They're incredibly personal. They don't happen in a vacuum with you individually by yourself. It's you and God. Wisdom about God's will for your life can only be understood in the context of an ever-deepening relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ. That's why he sent him so we could make the wisest decision of all, and that is to be freed from sin and to be freed from guilt and to be restored into relationship with him. That's why Jesus lived a sinless and pure life. That's why he gave himself on the cross in your place and in mine, so that we could experience life to the full, so that our lives could be foolproof, so that we could be wise and experience life as this amazing treasure hunt filled with reward, where the journey even of itself is a reward with him. That's what makes this all-in pursuit to get wise to his will so worth it because it's him leading you, teaching you, walking with you so that you can enjoy foolproof, abundant life with him. It's not easier. No, it's not. In fact, it's, it's harder, but it's better. And the truth is, there's something about it is glorious. All right, we're gonna move into baptism right now. And, and I think the way baptism connects into this series that we're in called Foolproof right now, a couple of ways. First of all, uh, sometimes people are making a decision about a next step in their spiritual journey. And they're like, you know, I'm praying about it. I'm just trying to see what God's will is for me about whether or not I should take this next step. And, and, and what amazes me is that you don't need to pray about whether or not to obey God. Can we just be clear about that? I know that might harm some of our, our sensibilities to, to hear that. But if God has been clear about something in Scripture where he says, hey, this is a way to walk in where you're going to experience greater wisdom, where you're going to experience greater life, where we're going to experience greater, stronger connection together, that's something that you do. If you trust it in Christ, that following him is something that we do. And part of following is obeying. One of the wisest things that you can ever do in your life is to obey God where he's already been clear in Scripture. We could spend the rest of our lives living out the clear commands of God in Scripture. There's so much of his will that's already revealed. And I don't know if, if all of us know this, but you know one of the reasons we exist as a church is to fulfill the commands of Jesus? Like some of his last words right after he, he, he ascended to the Father. I don't know what I'm doing there. After he, he just ascended to the Father, he, he gave us these last words and he said, here, I want you to go into all the world and I want you to make disciples, learners, people who are following after me, walking down this treasure hunt, this treasure trail with me and I want you to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. Jesus was elevating this incredible ritual, the sacred ritual of baptism to this really high place saying it really matters that people go public in their faith with me. It really matters that people publicly identify that they're associating themselves with, with me and my death and my resurrection, my life and my, my teachings. Saying, you know what? Yeah, I'm gonna be bold. I'm, I'm following Jesus. I'm holding his hand as I'm walking down this, this, this path, going down this, this, this treasure hunt of life. I want to run after him. Now, real quick, something for you to think about as you're maybe on the fence about whether or not to get baptized. I know some of you signed up. Some of you are, are thinking about it right now in this moment, which is awesome. Baptism is a whole lot like this wedding ring, okay? It's this wedding ring. Now, this, this ring does not make me married. This, this ring is a symbol of an internal reality of the relationship that Annie and I have and have had now for 25 years. It says, we will love each other with an unconditional love. I will love you with, as God is my strength, as Christ loved the church. But, but this isn't what makes us married. It's a symbol of an internal reality, an external symbol of an internal reality. Baptism is the same. Baptism does not save you. Please understand that. Only the grace of Jesus Christ through his finished work on the cross dying in your place, substituting his perfect life and righteousness for your imperfect, broken life and sin, only trusting in him will save you. Not baptism, but baptism is an external symbol of the internal reality that you have trusted in Christ, that you are trusting in him for the rest of your life, and you're gonna walk down this path with him, hand in his. 
And I know sometimes when we have like a crossroads decision like this, like, oh gosh, this is a, it's a big deal. This is a really big deal and I need courage, God, because I don't want to get up in front of all those people. Sometimes we need to ask God for the courage to be able to do it. And sometimes when you see eight or 10 or 12 or 20 or 50 or whatever people get baptized in a room with, with a couple thousand people in it, it can be pretty scary. But I want to encourage you with something real quick. And Windsor, I want you to do this as well. And if you're online, you can respond the same way. If you have been baptized before because you've trusted in Christ and you've gone public in your faith, would you just raise your hand? Just raise your hand for a second and, 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 for, and go ahead and just leave them up for just a second. And for those of you who might be on the fence or thinking about it, just look around real quick in Windsor, here in Loveland, online, you could do that little hand emoji. Okay, put them down now. The goal isn't to make you feel like, oh, I didn't raise my hand. The goal is to say, look at all the people around you who've gone before you and have had the courage to say, you know what, I'm going to do it. Now, I can almost guarantee you, if we could interview each of those people who had their hands raised, not one of them would say, you know what, I really regret it, actually. Uh, the water was colder than I thought it should be, okay? My t-shirt's already ripped. You know, I, nobody, I would, I, would, I would argue, nobody would say, I really regret going public in my faith for Jesus. It's a decision where you drive a stake in the ground and say, Jesus, I'm following you. And so that might be where you are. Let me ask you to go ahead and stand up to your feet right now. And I'm gonna say a prayer for us. And then we're gonna dive into this together. And I wanna encourage you, if you're in the place where you wanna trust that what Jesus did on the cross, he did for you. Or maybe you've already trusted that, but you haven't been obedient to take this step of faith and be baptized. And you want to do that, you just kind of slide out of your row, even right now or while I'm praying, you can kind of go over to the tank, uh, over to, to your left here in Loveland or to your right in Windsor, and somebody can talk to you about what it means to get baptized, make sure we're understanding it correctly. I want to encourage you to have the courage to be able to do that. There's no obstacle that should be standing in your way. The water is warm. We got dry clothes for you to change into. There's towels, okay? We are going to cheer for you until we lose our lungs, okay? You're going to be so encouraged. And this is going to be one of those moments of disproportionate influence in your life where you can say, wow, God's moved. So let me pray for us right now. So Heavenly Father, what we ask is that you would move in a powerful way in these moments. Not because the music is awesome. Not because we tend to be singing well this morning. Not because someone just inspired me with some joke or some idea that intrigues me, but that you would move in individual hearts because the power of your Holy Spirit is compelling someone, is compelling individuals to say, you know what, it is time. It's time. I want to walk down my life's path with you. I want to make a wise decision. And I want to keep making wiser decisions because I know that the way you give wisdom... <laughs> I discover it like an archaeologist, but I build on it like an architect. And the longer I go, the more I want my life to be wise. And so in these moments, we pray that you would give conviction and peace to be courageous and to step forward into the waters of baptism. And help the rest of us to be able to cheer with all that we are. This is what we pray in the name of Jesus. And everybody agreed and said... Amen. So I'm going to throw it to Windsor now. Windsor, go ahead and do your thing. Enjoy. And for those of us here in Loveland, guys, now is your opportunity to take your step, slip out, come on down over here, and let's the rest of us worship with all that we are. Search the world, but it couldn't feel me. Man's empty praise, treasures of faith, never enough. But you came along, put me back together.
influence. Let's pray together, can we? Heavenly Father, we are so proud of these guys, our brothers and sisters in Christ, who have decided to go public in their hope and their hunger and their faith in you. Jesus, thank you for the joy of seeing individuals up here who said, you know what, this is it. I'm going to make the wise decision to obey God and go public with my faith. Thank you for the families that are up here. Thank you for the couples that are up here. Thank you for what you're doing in the life of our church, these individual hearts and lives and families. We cheer them on with all that we are, and we know in this moment, you and all the angels of heaven are cheering as well, because there's nothing so beautiful as a freshly redeemed son or daughter who worships you wisely with their own obedience and their own courage. And so we ask for your grace to flood into their lives in fresh and wonderful ways. Would they celebrate today like they never have before? Would their friends and family swarm them and encourage them? Would this day be this incredible stake in the ground in their life where they could look back when difficult times come and know what it means to follow hard after you and to know what it means to be loved by you and to know what it means to experience your grace. What a thrill for us as a church to be able to celebrate these moments. We thank you and we worship you in the name of Jesus. And together, everybody agreed and said, amen. And can we give it up for these guys again? Way to go, guys. Way to go. Way to go. All right, blessings, everybody. Guys, I'm excited for you.